Now we will move on to part two, the introduction to the Oculus Quest. So the Oculus Quest um, is capable of all these activities. Here is the Quest 1, here is the Quest 2. Um, the Quest 1 has actually been discontinued by Meta and they recently announced that they will stop supporting it in the near future. Um, so if you have one of these devices, you have something that is going to be fairly rare. Um, in terms of the marketplace, the Quest is probably the most prominent product. Uh, it exists in the middle tier in terms of sophistication and price. On the lower end, you've got smartphone-based VR systems that typically involve just a simple headset that you might or might not have to assemble yourself, like a Google Cardboard product. And basically, you download apps to your smartphone and place it in the headset, and then you can enjoy lower end VR, but uh, they don't have motion sensing controls. And then you've got in the middle, the Quest line of products. Um, the innovation of these products is that they are actually standalone. So they do not require connection to a computer because they have computers within the visors. And that's an innovation that they've made over uh, prior Oculus product. Uh, in terms of further along the line, we've got higher end products like PlayStation VR 2, HTC Vive Pro, the latter of which you can try in a media creation lab by booking one of the two VR rooms for up to two hours. Those higher end VR systems require uh, connection, physical or wireless connection to a powerful computer that actually runs the software applications. And then at the extreme end, you've got complete VR systems that involve full body controls, essentially. So typically, you wear a harness that's strapped to uh, a column or something overhead to support that harness. And you might have to wear shoes or slippers and stand on a special platform, turntable, and not physically move your legs to move within the virtual world. Those are fairly rare and quite expensive. Okay, and motion sickness, that is definitely something to be mindful of for specifically when it comes to VR and video games. It's simulated motion that, that uh, is sick, the sickness. Um, and that is common. Basically, uh, it is important to understand the root cause and it is the result of of a perception discrepancy between your visual and motion balance systems. So in simpler terms, it's really your brain being confused by the signals that it gets from your eyes and the signals that it gets from your inner ears or the fluid within your inner ears. So there are some things that you can do as a user to turn things in your favor. Um, first is definitely clean the lenses using a microfiber cleaning cloth. Don't use any cleaning products, just use a clean fiber cloth, microfiber cloth. Uh, all VR headsets, most of them at least, allow you to change the distance between the lenses manually or mechanically. Make sure you do so so that they um, match the distance between your pupils. And always try to put yourself in a comfortable environment physically. Make sure there's sufficient airflow, comfortable temperature, if possible, try to introduce persistent and tactile stimuli into your experience. So like a fan or a rug that you can feel with your bare or socked feet. Start with low intensity experiences and stay there. If you find that motion sickness is a persistent problem, most experiences, most developers and companies will indicate the expected level of intensity, whether it's it's calm, moderate, intense. Just look out for that information. And also, just use short sessions. Just start off maybe three to five minutes. And if you like, comfortable, you can gradually work your way up. Now, in terms of developer-implemented options, um, many of them tend to be vision-related. And the intent is to basically 
make the virtual world seem less realistic, to try to mitigate that, that confusion that your brain gets between your eyes and your, your ears. So things like decreased field of view, disabling motion blur, um, implementing, enabling a fixed on-screen indicator, so maybe just a dot that stays in a persistent position on the screen. View stabilization, so some experiences might simulate head bombing as you move through the environment. Uh, some experiences offer alternative options for movement and turning. So maybe just instead of actually moving through an environment as though you're walking or running, maybe you have the option of essentially teleporting to a spot. Again, it's unrealistic, but that's the point. It's to subconsciously remind you that what you're seeing is not actually what's happening to your body. Um, but going back to what I said earlier, these types of options are very rare among VR experiences. Like Unless it's a video game like Resident Evil 4 that has all of these options, most VR apps will not offer it. Not yet. It might be years or even decades before these types of options become standard. Okay, here is an overview of the Quest, the original Quest headset. Um, on the right side of the visor, the right edge of the visor is the power button. So you press and hold to turn it on, and press and hold to turn it off, but I recommend um, turning it off from within the headset. And on the right side is the headphone jack. Here's the silicone padding. And uh, here is the headband with Velcro straps on the top and the two sides. Here is a view of the underside of the visor. So as you're putting it on, the volume buttons will be on the right side of the underside and the lens spacing slider will be on the left side. And so the reduce volume button will be on the inside as you're wearing the headset the inside of the right side on the underside. Now to put on the Quest, the original Quest, first you want to pull up the headband. So these sides will pivot upward. Just push them up as high as they will go. They'll be about 45 degrees to the floor. Once they're high, as high as they'll go, press the visor into your face so that the bottom part of the padding is aligned with your cheekbones and then if you're able to hold the visor in place and then pull down the headband over your head so that the back of the headband is at or below the base of your skull and ideally the sides of the headband would be parallel to the floor okay and if you need to detach the velcro straps on the top and sides and then tighten or loosen them as needed, and then reattach them. Okay, and then to take off the headset, you want to reverse the process. Most people will try to pull the visor away from their face, but you really want to lift the headband upwards so that the sides swing as high as they'll go, 45 degrees to the floor, then pull the visor away from your face. Okay. Here is an overview of the Quest 2 headset, so there's a slightly different design. Um, the, the power button is actually on the right side of the body of the visor as opposed to the right edge, the front right edge of the visor. There's no headphone jack on the right side, it's on the left side. Um, actually the Quest headset I believe has headphone jacks on both sides of the visor, but for the Quest 2 it's on the left side. Um, silicone padding, and the strap is slightly different. It only has one Velcro strap, and that's on top. Uh, and the headband itself is more cloth. There's, this part is not plastic. It's just all not plastic behind it. It's all cloth, essentially. Um, the volume button is in the same spot. It's on the right side, as you're wearing, on the underside of the visor. Uh, there's no lens spacer slider for the Quest 2. That's actually, the mechanism is you just manually move the lenses in and out among and choose among three different settings. And to put on the Quest 2, similar principle, you want to pull up the headband so that the sides are um, 45 degrees. Just pull them up as high as they'll go and it'll be about 45 degrees to the floor. 
the sides are a bit softer. There is a little bit of plastic behind it. Now I recognize it. Um, but as with the Quest, the original Quest headset, once you pulled up the headband, press the visor into your face, and then pull down the headband so that the back is at or below the base of your skull. Okay. And then you can adjust the top strap as needed and then reattach it and to tighten the sides. There's two bands on the back of the headband. Just pull them toward the front or pull them toward the back of your head to loosen. But regardless of whether you're using the Quest or Quest 2 headset, the headband should be parallel to the floor while you're wearing it. The back should be at the base, at or below the base of your skull. And I recommend tightening the headband as much as you can, right? If the headband, the bottom of the padding is below, sinks below your cheekbone, that will tend to make your head lean forward a bit. And that will cause, that's likely to cause strain in your neck. Um, and again, as with the Quest 1 for the Quest 2, to remove the headset, kind of uh, avoid the instinct of just pulling the visor away from your face. You want to pull up the headband, then pull the visor away from your face. So that's putting on and taking off the headset. Now we're going to look at the Quest and Quest 2 controllers. It's a slightly different design, but really the most important button for either controller design is the Quest trigger. So here it is in the dot photo. Here it is as a virtual representation. There's a trigger on both controllers. Basically, it acts as the left mouse button on the mouse of the computer. You press it to select, confirm, menu options. Um, alternatively, the A button on the right controller generally serves the same purpose. Here it is on the Quest 2 in virtual form. Um, and as you can see, both controllers have, will have a joystick. You use the joystick to move around, change your view within experiences, and you can also use them to scroll through menus. The alternative to scrolling through menus would be to press and hold the trigger button and then move the controller physically to move the menu or page. Uh, I don't want to forget the safety straps, so strongly recommend put your wrists through the strap, tighten them so that you can let them dangle if you need to. I'm demonstrating that right now. You can look at my simulated hands. Um, yes. Oh, in terms of knowing which controller goes to which hand, assuming you have two hands to use, um, the controller might have stickers left and right, but you can always look at the grip buttons on the side of the handle. So for the left controller, the grip button will be on the right side of the handle. And then for the right controller, the grip button is on the left side of the handle. So in other words, the grip button is always supposed to be on the inside of the handle. So in addition to, well, besides the trigger button, which is, as I said, the most important button, um, and to a lesser extent, the A button, which essentially replicates the trigger button. Um, the button that you really want to know, the one that you want to be able to locate and press without looking is the Oculus button. That serves to access the universal menu and bring up the quit prompts at any given time. So for the Quest 1, it is located at the base of the face on the right controller below the A button. The Quest 2, it's in a slightly different position. It is, you can see, it is below the analog stick, the joystick. So just practice until you can reach for and press the Oculus button without even thinking or looking at it. So I'm going to press the Oculus button. It's not represented in my virtual hand, but here is the universal menu. And you can access very various apps and menus. Oh. 
so what I'm doing right now is I'm using the trigger button to scroll through these slides. So let me, and here I'm actually using the A button instead of the trigger button. But like I said, the A button essentially kind of replicates the trigger button. And so here's the Guardian. This is, uh, as far as I know, an interesting innovation of the Quest product. Basically a system that is a virtual boundary that serves to warn you when you approach that boundary. Um, and that warning comes in the form of an automatic to switch to pass-through mode, which switches the headset's camera to show the external world. Um, there's two types of guardians. You can use a stationary guardian, guardian that uh, uses a predetermined radius. And then there's a room scale guardian, which allows you to manually draw the boundary. So I'm just going to briefly demonstrate. So I'm using, I'm, I'm seated, I'm using a stationary guardian. Uh, I'm looking down. I don't think, you won't be able to see, but I see a glowing blue ring. And you can actually customize the color of that ring. So if I approach the edge, more specifically, if the headset approaches the edge, the system will switch over to pass-through mode. So I'm just going to shift away from it slightly. Okay. Okay, now I am in pass-through mode. And you might be able to see the prompt on screen. Return to play area. You've left your guardian boundary. Please return or create a new boundary. Moving pass-through mode can increase risk of injury. So we're going to return to pass-through mode. So when I'm in pass-through mode, I can see the real world through the camera of the headset. But it's in grayscale and it's blurry. But you won't be able to see what I'm seeing because that's a built-in privacy design feature of the Guardian. So I'm going to oh, return to my play area and now you can see what I see and I see the virtual environment. So I'd strongly recommend um, uh, enabling double tap for pass through mode. So one way of enabling pass through mode is to actually go or approach your guardian boundary. But let's just go here. So I bring up the Aku, the universal menu, click quick settings, go to not guardian, but settings. And then in the Guardian menu, select Guardian menu. So I'm pressing the trigger. And then here is the option, double tap the pass-through. Double tap the left or right side of your headset to turn pass-through on or off. So I'm just gonna turn it off and then turn it on. So basically, you just double tap the sides or even the top of the, the headset visor. The system will recognize the minute shift in the visor and then it'll automatically switch to password mode on your command. So I'm going to just do that right now. Okay. Now the visor is not touch, set, touch, touch sensitive. The headset isn't recognizing the touch itself. It's recognizing the very minute shift in the headset's physical position in the real world as you touch it. So you have to double tap with a little bit of force. Okay, so that's pass-through mode. Again, um, regardless of whether you use stationary or room scale boundary, Guardian, you want to be mindful of where the physical surfaces, the hard physical surfaces are in your environment. So what some people will do is they'll set their boundary, if they're doing room scale, they'll set it right up against hard physical objects like furniture, like walls, like columns, but that's not really best thing to do. You want to give yourself a little bit of buffer space between your boundary and any hard objects that might damage your system or hurt, harm you. So really give yourself a buffer at least two feet if possible. At least one foot, ideally more than two feet when you're setting up a Room scale guardian or even a stationary guardian. You want to give yourself some space because the guardian doesn't physically stop you from going up beyond your play area. So here's just kind of an overview. Um, just note that when you turn on the headset after any period of activity, 
the system will prompt you to set your controller level and set or choose your guardian type. So to set the floor, calibrate the floor, you can physically place the controller on the floor or you can use the analog stick to move the projection of the floor to the physical floor. And that's what you do in pass-through mode. So in other words, when you turn on the headset, um, you start off in pass-through mode in guardian selection mode. Okay. And here's just an overview of the universal menu that I mentioned. Like I said, practice until you can press that Oculus menu without looking at it. So now we're going to go to a non-interactive non -interactive activity. So we're just going to try and experience within the Liminal app, which is a free to try app. So I'm going to press the Oculus menu to bring up the universal menu. And I think my headset is low on power. Uh, let's go to the app library. So over here is where your most recently used apps appear. But just so you're used to the app library, let's use the app library. And then here's the app library window. You can sort a few different ways by most recent and reverse and alphabetical order. Let's go by alphabetical order. Again, you can use analog stick to scroll up menus, or you can always click and drag manually to navigate through Windows. So where's Liminal? Here's Liminal. Welcome to Liminal. Okay, so here's a set of categories. Like I said, this app is free to try. Um, there's content that is free to use, but it rotates on a periodic basis. Um, so I am using the, the free version. Let's try off. Again, I'm pointing and pressing with the trigger. And you can use either controller. So right now my right controller is the primary, but if I press the trigger on the left controller, it switches to the primary controller. So you have that option. Uh, hmm, which one do I want to try? All right, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a tiger by the toe. If he haunts, let him go. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I think. Sure. Four minutes. Oh. Okay. Let's go with paper flight. Just because it's three minutes, and that's the length that I would like. So I have to click download. It tells you the release date and over here uh, the nature of the experience like the physical positioning the viewpoint whether or not controllers are used and there's a comfort rating so I've never experienced this particular experience so Columbia College Chicago
What was your greatest level of awe during the experience? I would say, so this is your standard Likert scale. Some people call it Likert, but correct pronunciation is Likert. I would say maybe a five. How much do you agree with this statement? I had goosebumps. I would say two, to be honest. How much did I enjoy the experience? I would say four. I liked the concept. The visuals were kind of basic, but that's really more of a limitation of the Quest system. It's not a super powerful computer. I did find it a bit jarring, to be honest, even as someone who is really experienced with first, playing first-person video games. I think just the movement was a bit disorienting. Um, that's where something, an option like being able to limit the peripheral vision or having a fixed point on screen would actually mitigate that motion six. Again, that's something that is not standard in VR experiences outside of VR video games. So that's definitely something that's holding VR back as a field for many people. But I appreciate the effort. Thank you. Okay. Paper flight. So I don't know if you notice, but uh, essentially we were on top of a paper airplane. Hence the name, paper flight. Okay. So to return, I can click this return menu, or I can always um, press the Oculus menu. So as I said, here I'm just going to resume. See how I'm holding up the controller? I can't actually see. That's interesting. I can't see the buttons as I would normally outside of this experience. That's why, like I said, it's really handy to be able to locate that quest button at will. And I'm going to, I could just exit normally, but I'm going to demonstrate how to quit an application using the Oculus menu. And just here's the prompt. I'm just going to click quit. That will return me to the home environment, which you can customize. There's uh, a set of virtual environments, home environments that you can, from which you can choose. I like this little studio setting. That's my preferred one, but there are other ones that you can try. Okay, so now we're going to move on to an interactive app. And hopefully this headset has enough battery power. Uh, so for that, I'm going to go to the app library because I've already installed and downloaded it. It's part of my library. If it's part of my library and not downloaded, I can just download it from this app library uh, menu. But to find other apps, you can go to the store application, store menu. From here, you can search for games, applications, and so on. You can download trial versions, demos, paid versions, if you are willing to buy applications. You do have to connect a credit card. But let's go to the app library, and then it's already sorted alphabetically, and here is the first steps for Quest 2 app. Now, if you're using Original Quest, uh, not surprisingly, you want to use First Steps for Quest. That's the name of that particular app. And this app is very brief. It's intended to get you familiar with the various controls buttons on the Quest and Quest 2 controllers.
Welcome to Oculus. After this tutorial, you'll be ready to explore. It's time to learn about your Oculus Touch controllers. Now, try pressing all of the glowing buttons with your thumbs. So there's A on the right controller, V on the right controller, X on the left controller. Try moving the thumbsticks the around. Okay. The thumbsticks can also be pressed like buttons. Press them in until you feel them click. Next, use your index fingers to squeeze the triggers on your controllers. Locate the grip buttons and squeeze them with your middle fingers. Now let's see what your virtual hands can do. To make a fist, squeeze the grip with your middle finger and hold it down. To point, keep squeezing the grip and just lift your index finger. Now use your index finger to push the button in front of you. To pick up an object, squeeze and hold the grip button with your middle finger. Try reaching out and grabbing one of these blocks. Release the grip button to drop it. Just going back to what I mentioned earlier about biases that are inherent in design. Just the your language of instructions. Can do just about anything. Go ahead. Play with some of these items. See, so like... They're making the assumption that I have two hands, that I have two index fingers, that I have two middle fingers. Not everybody has that anatomical situation. So like, if, for example, if I'm missing a finger, how I can just use another finger, but the language, the instructions should reflect that. I don't want to sound like a broken record, but that is something that VR developers, companies really need to take into consideration. Looks if... like you're getting the hang of it. Here's a few more to try. Squeeze trigger to drive blimp. Okay. I think it might be several years before we see alternative control options for VR systems to accommodate people who, for example, can't move their arms or don't have hands, people who can't move their heads, people who have hearing impairments. There's no subtitles. There's no options for subtitles. Or, for example, what if someone is blind in one eye or they have lazy eye? Is there an option to determine to choose which lens is shown and which one is not present. When you're ready to explore some new VR worlds, insert a cartridge into the console. Okay. Let's go with the old pistol. I could just hold the button, but I'm gonna try whoa, to be efficient. Oh. Oh, gosh. Okay. Good. That's the start. Fifty five seventy five. That's a pretty good score. Okay, that's enough of that. 
I play plenty of first person shooter games. When you're ready to explore another virtual world, insert the cartridge into the console. Shake the dance. Oh. Move my hands. Down. Is that literal or figurative? Grab a hand. I can't spin. Ah, I'll try. Free self finish, okay. Sorry, my friend, it's time to go. When you're ready to leave this tutorial, insert the exit cartridge. You've got the basics down. Time to explore all that VR has to offer. Have fun. Okay, let's go back to presentation. So, we looked at the Liminal app. Um, initially chose a different app, but because it's a free to try app, the content rotates. It's not always going to be the same content that's available. Um, and we looked at the First Steps app. Pretty effective way of getting people used to the controllers the buttons on those controllers. It's developed by Meta, I believe. Um, and some thoughts or questions that you have. Um, if you're interested in trying the Quest or the Quest 2, the MCL does have nine Quest units for loan and three Quest 2 units for loan as of this recording. You can borrow it for up to seven days. Just go to Room 207 in the Scott Library, bring your U-card. Um, ideally, try to reserve using the website, which I'll show you later. Um, yes, that's great. And as I mentioned earlier, you can try out the HTC Vive Pro system, which is a higher end VR system. You just book one of the two VR rooms on the website and you can uh, have to wait for an approval process. But yeah, and then you'll get a notification regardless of whether you're approved for that reservation. And same thing, you just go to Room 207, show you your card, and then we'll lead you to the space. Uh, but in terms of... Uh, Thoughts or questions, hopefully you learned a little bit about VR, what it is, its history, where it comes from, kind of maybe have a sense of where it's going. Think of the potential 
the positive benefits for humanity as a whole and maybe uh, your field of work or study, but also be mindful of the pitfalls, the downsides, so think of people who might be left behind if VR and VR adjacent technologies really does advance the way that some people seem to predict or promote. So my question really is, um, where do you think VR will be throughout the course of your lifetime? Um, if we were to plot the impact and the prevalence of that technology on a scale or a continuum, and on the one end, maybe, so, so say there's a scale of 1 to 10, and this one would be novelty. Maybe VR technologies, applications, and products are really just more in the realm of serious enthusiasts and researchers. And then at the other end of the scale, a 10, um, VR and VR products, XR as a whole, maybe just VR or maybe AR, um, maybe it becomes really a 10, like a novelty, more of a novelty as opposed to necessity. So maybe something as essential and everyday as computers or just smartphones. Like where do you think VR, AR is right now? And then where do you think it will be at its peak in your lifetime? Um, and then what needs to happen for technology to get to that point, that peak that you envision, or even the most extreme edge of uh, prevalence and importance in everyday society. So that's just something to consider. I uh, have my opinions, yeah, like everyone does. If you'd like to know more, you can visit um, the MCL website. Here's a short URL. You can email. You can also visit us in room 207 of the Scott Library. Feel free to join our Discord server. Um, that's it essentially for the presentation. I will make this slide deck available online. Thank you so much for participating in the way you have. And yeah, thanks.